This morning I'm interviewing two of the cast and crew from The Almighty Johnsons, a Kiwi comedy drama TV series about four brothers who just happen to be descended from Norse gods. Each of the Johnson boys, Anders, Mike, Axel and Ty, has his own godlike power. It's just that their powers aren't all that powerful. Emmett Skilton plays Axel, the youngest brother, who at the beginning of the series is ignorant of their heritage, but later discovers that he is Odin, the All-Father. Meantime, Tim Balmay plays Mike, the oldest brother, and God of Rock, Paper, Scissors. Emmett directs some of the episodes while Tim writes series. Welcome, Emmett and Tim. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Um, the Almighty Johnsons was created as a TV show about men and exploring what it means to be a man. Did you know what you were getting into when you auditioned? Well, I knew it was a show uh, targeted at bringing us the male audience uh, into viewing New Zealand television. And I knew that it was about a, a young teenager who was uh, figuring himself out through the device of uh, being a Norse god in the, in the modern world. But I didn't know the exact of the, uh, the show itself. But I imagine Tim did, considering you wrote some of it. Yeah, I worked as a, um, a storyteller on, on first episode, uh, first series. And uh, there was a genuine call out from the network to say, we're making a lot of um, female skewed as the uh, show goes in New Zealand. And particularly also in New Zealand, you've got to remember that um, uh, over recent history, our country's been, uh, dare I say it, dominated by women uh, in high places. Um, not that I have a problem with that, but uh, we've had female prime ministers and governors general and uh, chief justices, and uh, it's been an exciting time in our history. And that had, that, that had kind of been reflected in, in TV and the characters that were being, um, well, dominating our, our TV shows as well. So it was time to kind of swing back and, and get a male perspective on things. Uh, and how, in a Kiwi way, the best way to do that is to put together four brothers who aren't particularly that shit hot at most things. And that's the kind of under, understatement Kiwi way that we deal with that. So the four Johnson brothers, yes, they happen to be just, uh, descended from Norse gods, but because they're Kiwi brothers, that means that they're probably not very good at it. <laughs> what is it and that's where, that's where we derive our comedy from, and, and, uh, and we get drama from that, because when your, your heroes are battlers or, or strugglers, uh, um, that, that op, op, offers good dramatic opportunities. One thing I really appreciate about the Kiwi sensibility is it's not that far from the Australian sensibility. Mm. Like I, I found it was very relatable, unlike some of the American comedies. Well, it... um, how do you feel about? Oh, the... well, that's good to hear. Yeah. Sorry, we're ha we're having a few technical. Well, it's leave us in the fact that we don't have very big budgets. Sorry. It's reflected in our budgets as well. We don't have a lot of money to make one-hour television programs in New Zealand compared to the American budgets. So out of that uh, uh, challenge often comes uh, creative solutions. And the creative solution to that is to make it about uh, character-based interaction rather than high action state. Yes. Um how do you feel about the direction the show has taken? You, you've you've now made two seasons. I, I the show's taken. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really happy with the direction the show's taken. Uh, it's it's take, taking risks that we don't often see in New Zealand television with the introduction of a a science fiction direction. Um, which hasn't really been made for a mainstream adult audience in New Zealand before. And I think the the way that it's um, following Axel's journey of discovering his own values in, in his world, I, I'm, I'm very happy with it. I look forward to seeing where else it goes. Yeah. How do you feel about your characters, um, particularly Axel in the light of 
the soul of the father in the body of an idiot, and Mike for his history in seasons one and two, and being made fun of for his height. <laughs> really? I didn't know you were made fun of. <laughs> Tim, that's, that's pretty heavy. It is, it is a freak of nature that I was cast in a show with where the bulk of the cast are like over nine foot. <laughs> I'm, not actually, yeah. I'm not actually a short person. I'm a, I'm a very, I'm an almost tall person. It just so happens that everyone Compared else your kids. has been eating something and being breastfed on some sort of supercharged milk from their mothers. And they, you know, the, Michelle Langston, who plays Michelle, she's about 12 foot. And, <laughs> and then, then they put her in heels. And I mean, I'm not, not just little heels, nine inch heels. So I was, I was doomed. But I've, I've dealt with it and I've lived through it. And I'm, I say bring on series three. Completely. And as a writer, my plan is to put all the rest of the cast in wheelchairs. <laughs> Revolution. Oh, absolutely. Is there a season three scheduled yet? Uh, we're in negotiation with that at the moment. So uh, we've, we, these, in New Zealand, unfortunately, uh, series are never commissioned more than once at one at a time. It's just the way that the funding is structured here. And it's frustrating for us because if you could guarantee two or three seasons ahead, you could, everyone could plan their lives and um, you could also plan season arcs in a slightly different way. But that's the reality we face with all our shows here. So we're, uh, I think we're very close. And we, we, as I said, we're negotiating that right now. I'm going to be very upset if there isn't a season three. If if it doesn't come off, will there be novels or graphic novels or a web series? Uh, I, I don't know, but that's a very good idea. Um, I'm sure that we would look at all those options actually to make the most of of what's been a really exciting um, story to date and. And definitely unique and original, but certainly by New Zealand television standards. We don't, haven't made a show like the Almighty Johnson's before. Mm -hmm. So it, it, without wanting to delve too far into marketing speak, I think we've, we've created a really unique brand, and it would be a shame not to capitalise on it. I think the Almighty Johnson's is unique on a, the world stage, personally. Good to hear. Um, the artwork in the background for a number of the of the shots seems to be purposefully placed, and the t-shirts um, some people, especially Axel, wear appear to be <laughs> Easter eggs. What's the story behind this? Well, I know that uh, Tracy Collins, who is the second season production designer, and uh, Katrina, who is our um, costume designer for both seasons, consider everything when they are designing. So Tracy had. Um, meetings with us about our characters and our characters' arcs and things like that, and put in moments such as um, some of the artwork, and I, I don't know um, situations of it, but they put in things such as Axel's T-shirt where he see, um, he's got a, um, a T-shirt that has a, um, what does it say on it? It says, eat me. <laughs> no, no, it's got anyway. It's got. Um, it basically says like, "Death or glory," and it's kind of about um, Axel's expectation and Odin's expectation for his situation in the world. So there are small, like you say, Easter eggs in the in the costume, in particularly, and the artwork at Axel's house as well, all reflects their own attitude and um, moments that they've had throughout their relationships. Um, Axel and um, Zed's relationship, who is flatmates where they've been drunk wandering home one night and stolen a stop sign or where they've found a trampoline on the side of the road and brought it home to their to their own front yard. So everything has a story behind it um, and, and everything is, is considered. Is it like that in the right thing? Everything is considered. Of, of course it's considered, but do you, is there any writing that involves specific direction about what the set or what the... Um, costume may look like? Uh, only if it's story related. I mm -hmm. mean, um, when you introduce a character like, for argument's sake, Thor, you know, our, the Almighty Johnson's version of Thor is very much a king country farmer <laughs> type that is specific to New Zealand. And that is kind of articulated in the script. 
um, a set like in series two, Mike, you know, wins a bar and the bar was careful, careful. What? I don't know what season they're up to. Well, he might win a bar. <laughs> <laughs> but the history behind the bar, if, if he won a bar, <laughs> then he would, it would be a specific bar. And that was, that was, that would be written script thing. I don't, I, I won't say anymore. <laughs> Failing. <laughs> Yeah, the, the bar may have very, very significant um, purpose. Yeah, if, the, if there was a bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually expect a lot of the people who will be watching this interview won't actually have um, watched any Almighty Johnson. So I, I think uh, you'll be meeting oh, a whole new you're audience. In the that's, that's... Um, the United States show, or you, you slightly covered this already. But US shows tend to have wealthy characters with expensive houses, modern cars and wardrobes from designers. Uh, in, in contrast, the Almighty Johnson's is much more realistic. A builder struggling to make ends meet after being ripped off, a student living in a share house with mismatched furniture and a bomb of a car. And as you said, things that he's found on the way home. Why, <laughs> ha why, have, the, um, why have you chosen to do it this way? And do you think it adds to the, the comedy and the, the realism? I think it's um, accessibility and relatability. You know, not everyone in the world is, is rich and has designer clothing and lives in a mansion. Um, quite the opposite, in fact. And we've created characters and, and situations for these characters where anyone can relate to those situations and, and how they live their lives. Also, the other important part, I think, is it was always a very risky premise when the show was both pitched and commissioned, you know, for ordinary blokes who happen to be descended from Norse gods, what the audience were going to have to buy into was that these guys were gods of some kind. So the more they seemed based in reality, as you say, a builder and a student, a guy that works in PR and a fridge repairman, um, the, the more they were anchored in reality, the better chance we had of the audience buying into and relating to these guys as gods as well. And that was key to its success and, and, and it worked on that level. How difficult is it to write or direct an episode when you're one of the primary actors? And what are the differences this makes for you? I'll put it out there right now. I unfortunately didn't direct any episodes. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah. Um, he took his clothes off. I, I did <laughs> take my clothes off quite a lot. Yeah, so, so you've got to watch it for that. <laughs> he had to so God knows what he might have done. Well, yeah, yeah. So we, when he just kept taking his clothes off, we just went, okay, Emmett, I know you're keen. Yeah. You're just out of drama school. We'll let you take it off a little bit. You can't take them off all the time. In a way, that's directing from the inside because right. it immediately puts people in a certain <laughs> mindset right. and, and encourages them to, to yeah. act in a certain way. I feel quite proud of that, actually. However, uh, to answer the other half of the question, which is uh, writing and performing, it is a real, it, it's a surprisingly uh, tricky challenge. And um, I've done it a couple of times, but it isn't, it, it is a, um, there's a bit of a mind switch you have to make, which is if you, fortunately in our, in our case, the writing process is done before we go into shooting. So, to a certain extent, the storyline and the writing is done, and as me, me as a as writer then becomes actor, I can kind of leave it behind, and I, I make, have to make a very conscious choice to just forget about it. And the best days are the days when you walk on set, or doing a scene, and you're going, I'm not entirely sure what the writer meant here. Oh, oh, I wrote it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and I mean that in all seriousness. If, if you can forget that you wrote it, uh, you're in a good place, I think, as, a, as an actor. And uh, that actually has happened on several occasions. And <laughs> uh, it's good. Um, but it is important to forget that you've written it because otherwise you run the risk of being the, the actor who's written it and trying to advise the director, who wasn't him, that uh, <laughs> on, on how to do the scene. And that, and that would be bad for everybody. So... It's about. It's very important to know your place at any given time. Yeah. What was that, Fern? No. no. 
but Fern is over there. Hello. Hi. Um, they say comedy is all in the timing. How much of the timing is in, in the acting, the writing, the directing, and how much is in the editing room? I, I, I agree that the editing um, can often help with timing, but it has to be right on the day on, as an actor doing it on camera. You can't, you, you, what editing can do is take something that's good and, and just make it extra special. But if it's not good in the first place, you it basically ends up on the floor and not being used. There's no there's no magic bullet there. So um, I think we're really fortunate in the Johnsons with the whole cast. Actually, They're, it's a great cast, and um, you know people like Emmett and and Dina Gorman who plays Anders and and, and Jared and Fern, uh, they all have excellent timing. And the show, uh, I think the writing and and the sh style of the show allows that stuff to shine through. Um, the Almighty Johnsons is a comedy, but at the same time it's dealing with real issues such as date rape, domestic violence and relationships in general. How have you personally engaged with these issues while working on the show? Well, there's been a, a certain amount of um, publicity around those kinds of Things and being involved in certain groups, um, which I I can't name. One of them is What the F, which is a um, a organisation over here that's about the um, um, encouraging the comfortability and um, uh, reassurance of of um, homosexuality and bisexuality in New Zealand. Um, but also on set, we all of those situations are treated um, quite carefully. Uh, you know, just like you do with a, a sex scene, all of those moments of such as the domestic violence is spoken through with the cast and the director. They're they're treated very carefully when they're filmed at the time. Uh, nothing is is thrown around and and done willy nilly. It's it's all very um, I'd say precious without being taboo. It's, um, it has to be a lot of care. Yes, because we have a broadcasting standards authority here too. So anything that is dealing in those areas, it gets run by those people uh, before it goes to air anyway. So that any anything that's questionable has had a professional objective eye taken on it, and uh, no one no one wants to uh, run roughshod over that sort of stuff. So there's there's good checks and balances in place. How hard is it for you as, as people, though? I mean, like Marina Baccaran, who's working in um, Homeland, she was saying that she and Claire Danes have spent a lot of evenings, you know, drinking a bit of wine afterwards because it's, it's really deep stuff that they're dealing with. How, how difficult is it for you on a, on a personal level? Drinking? It's not hard. Being a good very good at it. Uh, here's champagne. Likes a good champagne and an oyster. Um, I, I think, I think to be honest, it's uh, it's what you do for a job, and we're fortunate in this country to have opportunities on shows like this, where you get to uh, even on our soap operas here, like Shorten Street. Those issues are dealt with quite regularly, and I think as actors, it's a privilege to be given the opportunity to. Tell a story about those things, but um, at the end of the day, as they say, um, you've got to let it go, move on, go home, and in some cases, cook dinner or drink. Uh, sometimes Emmett drinks. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> I do. He's not drink. I am. Thank you, Timmy. Um, have have engaging with these. Um especially gender relationship issues on the Almighty Johnsons, has that changed your attitudes at all in relationships? <clears throat> Not for me personally. I've always had a, a um, strong belief in, in gender equality and, and um, all of those kinds of things. I'm, I was brought up by a single mum with four boys and, and she did quite well. So I've, I've always had a very, very worldly, um, I guess, understanding of all that kind of thing things um, about you? 
Uh, yeah, no, I was brought up in a um, nuclear family, and uh, yeah, yeah, exposed to stuff. Uh, very fortunate to have that sort of upbringing, and uh, fortunate to have a family that believed in in respect for all races, creeds, mm -hmm. genders, and stuff. So, um, I also think both Emma and I come from a theatre background, and when you work in the theatre. Uh, you're dealing with that stuff all the time, both on stage and backstage and professional capacity. So you're, mm -hmm. you've, you've seen a lot. You've mm -hmm. seen a lot by the time you um, get to work here, I think. And yeah. I, we take it for granted, really, to be honest. So neither of your mothers went off to become trees? <laughs> Actually, yeah. no. The term was enough. Yeah. No, un unfortunately... Or fortunately, none. <coughs> none of the gods uh, seem to be bisexual or gay, but one goddess mm -hmm. in the series was bisexual and another one was a lesbian. But then the lesbians started taking male lover lovers. Why is there such mm -hmm. a focus on heterosexuality for the guys? Um, I guess, in a way, the, the story we've chosen to tell is a... <clears throat> A Norse myth or, or part of Norse history about Odin and his relationship with Frigg, who is a female. So I guess that's the driving um, um, story behind the show is a heterosexual relationship. I guess if it was a homosexual relationship or, or a bisexual relationship, that was the myth we chose to um, follow. It would be a, a different, um, you know, the relationships would be different, the sexualities would be different, but that's what we've. Um, to explore. I think also to be honest when you're dealing with what I said before is like it's a reasonably risky premise in terms of mainstream free-to-air television mm -hmm. uh, to get people the, the wider audience to buy into the idea that these normal guys are gods is a big challenge in itself if you were to overlay the fact that and introduce homosexuality or bisexuality at that early stage um, you're making that challenge even greater. So I'd say that if the show beds in mm. and continues to, 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 to grow, then those are the opportunities I think that you can bring in at a later stage when people are comfortable with the, 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 the original premise mm. and start pushing the boundaries at a later stage. Mm. In because season... we all know, of course, gods were a little bit, you know, they could, oh, yeah. they could take it both ways a lot of the time. So it's certainly territory that is not, uh, that is well vetted in terms of mm. their mythology. And I know there's a great story on its way between Loki and Thor who cross-dressed and went to bars, so yeah. I can't wait to see uh, Jeff Dolan and, and one of our fantastic actors, um, and Shane Cortez, get their gear on uh, female style. And I'm not going to do a, a you know, spoiler alert, I'm not going to do a spoiler, I don't know how to say that, but uh, in, the, in the second series, on episode five of the second series, something pretty special happens with this character. Mm. Um, I won't say any more, but we, yeah. we certainly, as I said, pushing the boundaries yeah. as, as we go along. And like I said earlier, it's about Axel discovering his own values by being put into all these situations, and there are situations involving sexuality that help to grow him and, and give him that chance to make his own decisions about what he thinks about the world rather than having Anders tell him one way or, or Ty tell him the other way. Mm. Uh, so it's, it, is, it does all um, eventually have a chance to be explored in the show. I thought season two, episode five, was it, it was an idea that has been done before, but I thought the way you did it was unique and, yeah, I, I really loved it. Yeah, it was a very popular episode, yeah. Mm. I enjoyed reading it until the point I realised I wasn't actually in it. <laughs> and that's all I'll say in terms of spoilers. <laughs> in season two, the Maori gods were brought into the series. Did you guys work with the Maori community on these episodes? Uh, yeah, interesting, because um, I storylined that episode and wrote a draft of it. And because I work in development in the company as well. So when we came up with that story idea, we have a Māori um, consultant or advisor. So we, we ran the idea past him first to get 
Um, but well, to get a blessing to do it and to get, get our backs straight so that we weren't going to um, cause any greater disrespect by um, saying saying the wrong thing or using the wrong gods. Because there are uh, cultural boundaries in the Maori world that are quite specific, and it's easy mm. to get them very wrong. Mm. So yeah, we, we, we took advice. Um, mm. And then, of course, once it's cast, and the, the, the actors that we cast that were fantastic, mm. and they all have their own uh, take on the material, and generally they wouldn't do it if they didn't feel comfortable. You know, they wouldn't have done it if they didn't feel comfortable with it. But uh, by the time we got to production of that episode, those guys were comfortable and they had a lot of fun doing it. Mm. What was the reaction from the Māori community? Um, funny you should say that because I, I bumped into a lot of um, my kids are Māori and they go to a full immersion Māori school and the Johnsons, uh, which is where they only speak Māori, and the Johnsons is very popular there um, amongst you know a very uh, um, broad Māori community. It's real, you know, real people doing real jobs, but they happen to really like the Johnsons. So when that episode and those characters arrived, they thought it was Christmas. You know, they thought, <laughs> they thought it was great. Yeah. Because again, it's, it's, as we were talking before, it's about, we have this great opportunity with this show to introduce uh, interesting guest characters and characters from different uh, niches of society. So whether it is a bisexuality, bisexual character at a later stage, or Maori gods, or um, uh, Norwegian gods, whatever, we can do that. Um, as long and the only the only real rule we have with the show is that if you're going to do it, you've got to have fun. Mm. Yes, yeah. So if there is a third season, will the Maori characters come back? It's too early to say, but I would think why not? I mean, mm. uh, as, as they say in the rugby world, they they're high impact players. You you bring them off the bench. Um, <laughs> I don't know a lot about rugby, but I think that's what um, <laughs> I was doing quite well. And I realised I was failing there. So <laughs> they're impact players, you know. It, it, I guess what my the example of that too character like Thor. I mean, he's a fantastic character that you bring in. Uh, it's like spice mm -hmm. in cooking. You only use cayenne and pepper sparingly, but when you do, it's Greatly appreciate it. And I also guess the beauty of television is no one's no one's story is completely told unless the character dies. So there's always opportunity, such as what we've done with Thor, is, is opportunity to bring him back um, like a nice cane spice, perhaps. <laughs> um, bring, bring them back when need be. And I definitely think the Mighty God's story hasn't been completely told yet. Can I say that... Um Using the analogy of the canned spice, I mean, my, I, I'm just seeing that scene where Thor is reintroduced in the second season, and that that first scene, and I just, I just cracked up. Great, so wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit of, um, uh, is it? Do you call it trivia, or what do you call it? Um, yeah. Inside information. You heard it here first, without spoiling. <laughs> you know that. That little house that he comes out of. <laughs> yes. What do you what do you call them over there? Dunny. Ah. Oh, we call them long drops. Oh, well, that too. It's mine. Yep. It's oh, mine it's yours. <laughs> yeah. Long drop. I, I leave it to the production. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I built that. Was it on site? <laughs> no, they. Um, it was on my. I've got a place up north, uh, a retreat, and uh, it it was disused. <laughs> so they went and picked it up, put it on a trailer, and they took it to the location. And um, oh, I've got it back now. It's at my house in town. Did you write your name on it somewhere? <laughs> it's my. It shows my firewood now. <laughs> so there you are. You did that first. Yeah. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. I haven't offered my toilet whatsoever to the production, but um, I'll, spoiler, make, I'll make sure I do it. Two, three. Spoil it now. It's spoil it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, science fiction and fantasy fans tend to be really loyal and supportive of 
know, they're, they're actors and they're writers and so forth. Have you engaged much with fans at, at expos and conventions yet? Yeah, yeah. To, to quite a large extent in New Zealand, we've um, I think you guys have in Australia Armageddon Expo. Yes. Uh, which, yeah, we we have in um, four main centres in New Zealand, and we've been to all of them so far. And in a way, you feel like a rock star. Everyone calls out Odin and and Iceman and oh, that Grandpa. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you, you do feel like a rock star. And we've we've had the opportunity to have um, panel discussions with um, you know packed out crowds asking questions, which is meant to be for an hour that's lasted almost over two hours and we've had to be sort of pushed off stage so that we we can go and do our next thing at the expo. So it's it's had a great reception at those expos and we've also had a, a wicked time with it. So hey, Australia, bring us to your Armageddon's, your, your Comic Cons, all that kind of stuff. We'd we'd um love to engage with everyone we can. It's great. We would love to have you. What plans do you have for the future? Uh, outside of the Johnsons? Well, as we can't, yeah, yes. Until there's more Johnsons. Yes. Um, uh, I have a, um, over here we have the New Zealand film, film Festival at the moment, the International Film Festival, and I've got a um, feature film in that that's um, doing quite well. And I also uh, am working on a theatre show that was part of the International Arts Festival here last year that we're redeveloping and touring to Auckland and Wellington and a few places in between. So. I'm keeping myself quite busy at the moment, and, I've, and Tim is after this is going back to his office to develop a more fantastic story for the Johnsons. I hope well, that's the plan. Hopefully, uh, very soon I will be uh, busy with uh, James Griffin and um, our other colleagues storylining the next series. So, um, fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. Well, can you um, let us know as soon as there's an announcement, please? You will hear it. Mm -hmm. You will hear about it. Fern will make sure that you hear about it. Oh, well. We'll let, let you, um, we won't keep you in suspense any longer than we have to. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're in suspense too, so we know how it feels. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you very much for talking to Dark Matter today. I understand that Tim has another appointment to go to. Yep. So, um, so I've... It's been great to talk. It's been good fun. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll see you uh, in Series 3, hopefully. Mm. And enjoy series one and two. Check it out. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thank you.